Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Norbert and company for uh, organizing this. Um, it's always great to be in Vienna. It's great to be at the Schering Institute. Uh, it's great to be together with a crowd like this. So, um, I put my title as Hunter's Construction. Uh, I don't know whether the person likes it. Um, so I'll just spend a minute at sketching, not really the history, but a little bit prehistory. And, uh, and as all developments in, in science, and, uh, and certainly also in, in mathematical physics, um, nothing comes out of the blue. Uh, there is a, a lot of things go in there, and what adds a little bit, and you get something great and something new. And, that's the way to think about it. Uh, and maybe more than the construction, the general proof that this index, of which I will show the construction, is an invariant of uh, the gap symmetry protected spaces. It's really the contribution of a forgotten. So, so why talk about this here? Um, I'm not going to be talking about MPS or PNS. Directly. Uh, but this is an example of uh, something I think is a, a really important result, an important development uh, that I, I don't see how it would have happened. It certainly <coughs> did happen with <coughs> the input of a particular student in the special case of models with minimum ground states and then generalizations. Um, I think it's, a, it's an important uh, I mean, Maybe it's not what most of, of you and most of the people working with tensor natural states do, but it's nevertheless, I think, a very important aspect of it that it has given as a way of thinking about quantum lattice systems and minimum states, ground states in particular, the quantum lattice models, um, that has advanced uh, sort of the, the understanding of the field as a whole. And so initially, the result that was restricted to the case of MPS states Later uh, led to a proof of a general result for general class of gap systems. The area law in one dimension, you can see that the area law in one dimension is a, is a good example of that. And so is the index for FPD basis. So, so that's why I'm talking about this here. So, a little bit of uh, history, or maybe I should say prehistory. Um, I'm going to be very brief because otherwise, I want to have time to show you the construction. It would be such a pity. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, symmetry protected. Yeah, that should spell it out once. Topological phases. As a notion, um, as far as I know, Appeared uh, first certainly explicitly in papers by Penny and Wen, 2011. And the, the index I will be talking about, and it is almost simultaneously shortly thereafter, I will try to check the index. It is papers by Holman, uh, Berger. Shikawa, same years, I believe. Well, there are more papers. Um, not sure I know them all. I certainly haven't read them all. But uh, um, as far as I know, the, the notion of a simply protective phase, I, I, I think everybody has heard about it, but I will give a definition in a little bit for those who haven't. Um, it was introduced then, and an index which was. Uh, uh, the index took values in labels for the preference classes of projective representation of the symmetry that protects the phase. Um, and so that this could be constructed and understood as an example <coughs> in MPS states. That's what in, in that paper. 
And, um, and so, but then, uh, certainly these phases are stable. There are already stability results um, uh, available around that time that show that if you have, uh, let's say, a quantum lattice model short in interaction, a unique gap ground state, then uh, you can perturb it in quite an arbitrary way. As long as it's not too much, you will still have a model with unique ground state and respect of that. And uh, we know examples with matrix product states and tensor matrix states. If you can perturb them, you will, in general, get examples that have nothing to do a priori with tensor matrix states. Um, and then uh, they have essentially qualitatively the same behavior. And so we, uh, we try to. Uh, it was sort of, sort of an attempt that was highly successful with Bachmann. That was 2014, I think. Uh, the construction of a representation for, for non MPS, some non MPS cases. But for some reason, we focused on representations of the covering group instead of projective representation, but it's, a, it's the same representation. We didn't really get to the index, so this was not an entirely successful attempt. But as far as the representation itself goes, it turns out that um, in, in special cases again, uh, this was, uh, they were already found and discussed in a slightly different context before the notion of FPT phases was even around. So there's a few names I, I, I need to mention. Uh, so there was a, a paper by Matsui in 2001. He showed that um, uh, the state satisfies a property called split property, which basically was patented at the time, uh, that would be such a projective representation uh, associated with certain symmetry. He was focused mostly on field chains with SU2 symmetry, but uh, <coughs> not a general fact. And then, in <coughs> 2010, so this is for split states, uh, he showed that unique gap run states are split, have this property. In other words, this representation then can be constructed for, for these examples. If you have unique gap ground states, which is exactly the main situation we are studying um, when discussing SPT phases. And the related work also she said I shouldn't forget to mention by Danny Jorgensen and also Ishimoto co-workers, this is all early 2000s. But of course this was before uh, FPT phases were thought about, right? Um, and then, uh, so, so what, what Yoshiko did, she first of all put these, these things together, that this representation is really the representation we are talking about, uh, and proved that it's an invariant. So that is uh, happened in some papers 20, 20, 20, 21. In one dimension and then generalized systems for fermions, two dimensions and so on. I'm not, not gonna talk about fermions, I'm not gonna talk about two dimensions. Um, but I thought it would be good to sort of explain how it works uh, in the you know, simplest possible setting and then uh, Maybe the more the more you know, you, the more you like it. Maybe if you want to know more, you will like it a bit more. So that's that's why I'm giving this talk, and that's what I want to do. So let's get started. So we're, we're talking about uh, spin chains or or qubit chains. So uh, the lattice is just Z, and for all X and Z, we have a Hilbert space, which is finite dimensional. And the dimensions of these spaces don't really 
It will be the event that we will talk about one given system where these dimensions have been chosen, um, but they don't otherwise play a role. And then we have, uh, as usual, the local observables. And I will, so for lambda finite, specifically use intervals. Um, these are just the observables on the Hilbert space. Lambda, so it's a constant product of matrices. And local observables are the union of all of these. And the quasi local observables are the addition of that. The proper mathematical setting of uh, what we're going to discuss, and maybe we're going to construct this. Objective representation that is in terms of the index um, uses the fact that this is a C star algebra. So what it means that it has all these local observables and then it's completed for the norm and for things that uh, can be defined to be continuous later on. Um, okay, so then we will be talking about. Uh, Model Hamiltonians. That I'm going to formally write sum of x in uh, z and integers n greater than zero of terms p x comma n. Where this p x comma n is in the algebra of the interval x minus n x plus n. So this whole discussion can be done in, in different uh, sort of categories, different contexts. You can just look at finite range interactions. You can look at interaction with a certain UK, where the range can in principle be integers. And um, I'm going to assume that the norm of these TXNs uniformly in X is bounded by some such exponential function. So theta could be one, that it's exponential decay. If it's less than one, stretch exponential. You can also try to do this in the in the, in the class of systems with uh, interactions that decay faster than any power flow. Um, so if I, if I take this, then everything that you need to do this is in the literature. And every power law gives a few things to uh, stuff to do. So I'm going to not mention it explicitly, but in, implicit when I talk about interactions and also curves of interactions that will assume that I have stretched exponential decay in this sense. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm also going to consider differentiable curves. So, um, so this is a, a P, and I also can have P's that depend on a parameter s, maybe in 0, 1, or an interval. And um, you can see that it's differentiable. This is derivative with respect to s. Each of these are, uh, these are continuous. And Interactions that satisfy again this uniform stretch section for to be for, for some parameter. Which don't have to be the same as usual. So that's the kind of curves of interactions that I'm going to consider. Okay. So I don't I didn't tell you anything new, but is this clear enough or what do you mean by P? Wise, so they can jump at a few points? Yes, the derivative, if the derivative is oh, okay. has the isolated this continuity, then I can actually generalize this more with a little bit of a um, I mean, this, this is what you're naturally going to arrive at if you, if you concatenate the curve. Oh, I see. <clears throat> okay, 
So then the, these interactions are, of course, from E, you get the Heisenberg dynamics. Which you know, we know by the phi. Sometimes drop the phi. So um, I can think of so this is a, a function of a fixed and observable A, like quasi local observables. It's a continuous function of T in this algebra, has the group property. Group properties, I'm sure I don't have to define the Heisenberg dynamics. So usually, because it's for an infinite system, this is gotten to by taking a common energy. Um, there's other things you can say about this. But, um, and of course, but even that, I probably don't have to say, but this, this, this satisfies the differential equation that the, the analytic is the commutator of the Hamiltonian, which is, which is defined even for the infinite system, if I define it by a limit, due to these decay conditions that have assumed on the curves around. Defined on a, dense, on a dense domain, which is sufficient for this too. <coughs> okay, and then uh, states of the inference system so that we sign with expectation values, so they are linear function of a linear function of A that is positive and minimal. So, um, so this is a natural generalization. If you do this in finite dimensional context for the finite system, this is just saying that uh, the state is uh, given by a density matrix and the expectation is uh, of an observable A is trace rho A. To generalize that, you get uh, this notion. And then uh, something important for what we're going to do is the DNS representation. It says that um, um, there is a representation of any of such, uh, such states as a vector state if you represent the observables on a superimposed space. Okay, so for all omega, there exists a representation of the algebra A um, on, on the Hilbert space. H says that the following things hold. Call the representation phi. Um, this is a cyclic vector for this representation. And that means that if you apply all the observables to the vector, you get something that is dense in the Hilbert space. And that says that you have chosen this Hilbert space in a minimal way. You can always extend it. And uh, I still have the following representation. Um, that omega A is given as the vector state in the vector omega in this representation. And uh, this, uh, with these properties, it's unique up to unitary equivalence. Um, um, it will be essential for what we do because this projective representation of which the equivalence class is really the index of our phase will be a unitary representation of the symmetry group on the curve. Right. Question. So if you do, we do this for a finite system, right. if, if you start from an omega which corresponds to an actual mixed density, like a dense, right. an actual density yeah. matrix, does this GNS representation? Give you construction right now that the purification state is, of this of this. That's just a purification of that. Minimal purification would be the G the GNS representation. Um, so one thing maybe that I should say, if you're talking about unique uh, ground states of a system, those are pure states, and that is not mixed. And uh, in the case of pure states, these representations are very useful. Omega is a pure state. 
for instance, the unique ground state of for example, Tony, or some dynamics that perhaps we have defined, then time is irreducible. And this means that if uh, an operator commutes with, uh, with the representatives of the uh, of all observables, then it must be one to one dynamic. So if T is in D of H such that T pi A is equal to pi E T for all A, then this implies that T is equal to a constant times the other. It's the notion of irreducibility that we can see. Okay. Um, good. So, so that's general. Um, so let me let's start with defining what an FTP case is. Yeah. So the condition you just wrote down doesn't say anything about omega or w. So 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 so. Well, I mean, this would be the so representation is depending on it's like. So this is this representation. This GNS representation. Yeah. That is unique up to unitary equivalence. For pure states, omega is an irreducible representation, which means that the only things that come with of all the observers in the representation. I know, it's a little bit telegraphic style. Yeah. Okay. But of course, there's, there's a, in general, that I will be talking about representations, I, would also define, I could also define a reducible in this way. So, um, some other equivalent definition. Uh, but is that the definition of, of how you, or is that how you characterize a pure state in this setting, or is there no, an intrinsic way? Not, not usually. Um, a pure state would be one that you cannot write as a convex combination as two other states. That would be no, it's not a mixture of any, any of the state states. <coughs> Which again in the final case is exactly saying that the density matrix is length one. Okay. So, so G is going to be a group. Representing symmetries, I'm going to take the simplest case where these symmetries are represented uh, at each side by a unitary. There's other symmetries, lattice symmetries, time reversal symmetries, and so on, that you can also consider, and Ford can consider, and, and Yushiko Gara also considered, but let me just fix uh, so the simplest case. So it represented. Unit there is u x g for each x g, right? And g. Uh, maybe there's, there's the two rotations, or maybe it's a finite group uh, in general. So it doesn't matter here what we, what we consider. So that's on, on each uh, side. And then, uh, so on A, g is then. Represented. These are the observables, right? And then we're going to have automorphisms given by the adjoint representations of these acting by, by conjugation. So, so beta g will be tensor product of all x and the lattice of conjugation with u x. And u of a is u a u sub. But using a different equation, so I just kind of continue to Okay. So, um, but this is a potential symmetry. It becomes a symmetry of the system. I'm going to assume that. Uh, so, strictly speaking, we would just require that it commutes with the dynamics. But I'm going to assume that it actually each of these terms in the Hamiltonian the way I've written it uh, are invariant in the symmetry. I can also cheat that. So, so the system is 
symmetric given this representation. And then it's assumed that B dot J of the P is N. Okay. Um, maybe it's <coughs> polynomials and Heisenberg interactions would be invariant and would be active not as you do, for instance. Um, okay. So now uh, these phases you refer to equivalence classes by the definition of some equivalence of, of interactions. We put a uh, whole bunch of interactions and on one phase they say uh, certain properties and, uh, and give this polygon of the final. And we're going to do it just for the case where we have unique Gapian states. And I maybe should give a definition of that, a strict mathematical definition, if you're interested. I, I can tell you, but you what you're thinking about is probably correct. So I'm going to assume that. So, so let uh, P0 and P1 be two interactions. And when I say that, I assume the structure that I presented there on the left uh, is in between class X and B plane. Um, two interactions with a unique gap ground state. And there's a, a simple mathematical definition of that. On the one, and they can, there's the, the fact that it's uh, gapped in the GNS representation, in fact, takes the form exactly as you want. You can define the dynamics by the Hamiltonian, the unitary group generated by the Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian uh, for the gap ground state will be a positive operator. The ground state energy will be normalized to zero, and the gap means that there is no spectrum of the sort of strictly positive value gamma, which is, I think, the picture you have in mind. So, um, so we are going to say um, we're going to define an equivalence relation P zero B equivalent to P one, so that exists. Differentiable curve of interactions P of S um, with um, P of zero, P zero, it connects these two, P of one is P one and Models with the S also have a unique gap ground state. This gap bound is below by some positive number. That is independent of S. So if I can uh, see these two interactions, these two models, as being interpreted by a nice curve of models. Then you have this parameter S, and the gap doesn't close. Uh, and importantly, PS is G symmetric. In other words, these are, these are also G symmetric. It's implied by this. If that's true, then. Uh, I call these, uh, I say that these two interactions belong to the same phase. It's an equivalence relation. Conclude it is an equivalence relation. And so within the uh, space of all interactions that satisfies the conditions and the symmetry, uh, there is an equivalence relation um, of the, the lambda of the gap. And uh, it's defined in terms of the G. 
the larger G is, the, the stricter this uh, condition is, and the more equivalence classes I will have. In particular, um, I can also define equivalence without symmetry by just taking the integral okay. So, um, Well, uh, that is strictly finer, I, I don't know, but uh, no, it's an, it's an obvious statement. No, because it also allows for less Hamiltonians, right? I mean, if you, if you increase the symmetry, you right. kick out possible Hamiltonians, so you could have quite less basis. Oh, that, that's, that, that's true, okay. Okay, so it's right. not, uh, it wasn't meant any no. Um, I was just anticipating what I was going to say next. Uh, <laughs> okay, that statement is important. You start with that. <laughs> yes. And how the relation is the local Hilbert space always fixed? Okay. Yeah, so I, 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 I keep this fixed. So there, there is no uh, uh, comparison of models here with different, different Hilbert spaces, which people also do, but um, uh, that's sort of a different thing. Yes? Is differentiability important as opposed to continuity, for instance? Hmm. Continuity of? Of the path. Or if it's, for oh, instance, yeah. smooth, for instance, does it change the, the result, or is that essential? Um, so, strictly speaking, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I can certainly make sense of it by weaken it a little bit. It wouldn't be, make sense to strengthen it and take out the paths or things like that. I, I don't, I don't see why. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, I actually don't think there's a big difference. But if you if you don't assume anything, well, so first of all, if you don't assume anything, uh, I think you get some good work. Uh, and con I'm not sure continuity alone is in the sense that these paths are not rectifiable or something like this. I'm not sure of that. It's possible, um, but they certainly. I wouldn't know how to prove anything. And we will use differentiability. There is, there is a form of derivative used in, in the proofs. And that's why I think it's differential. But if you, if you the, 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 the notion of derivative could be weaker than the, 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 the standard derivative. Yeah. OK. All right, so we're not talking about uh, thinking ahead. Um, so in, in one dimension, which is the situation that we are, that we are discussing here, um, it, it is proved in certain contexts and believed. And if there is updated proofs, I mean, I'm happy to learn about um, <coughs> that um, uh, the equivalence class here is trivial in the sense that we talk about specifically um, any phi p is equivalent to the so-called trivial interaction. So the trivial interaction is the one here yeah, we write it in this uh, language of terms, phi x n. You only have one side terms of n equals zero that are just acting on x and they take say the form one minus phi x phi x where phi x is a unit vector in the Hilbert space of x. And so then uh, this one has a unique ground state, which is simply a product state of the state Px over all x in the max. That's sometimes referred to as the trivial phase, the phase that contains that point. Um, if I don't impose any symmetry, the statement is that all gapped interactions with the, with the unique ground state are equivalent to the situation. Well, 
I, I don't think so. I can, so I'm going to assume that this is true. I could, I could assume a little less, something that you can prove, but it would be too long for reflection. Um, in certain contexts, this has been proved. Whether it's proved in the context I, I stated here, I, I, I don't think so, but if, if somebody knows. Okay, so, so I'm going to assume that, that, that we have this to be a shortcut in the case. Um, I'm going to summarize in this study what are the graphic results. Result one is that the P is a G symmetric. Interaction with unique cat run state. Um, then this the projected representation of G on the DNS end of things. This one, the DNF representation. Um, that implements symmetry. So what it means is that um, uh, the representation of G of G acting uh, on the right half So I take the tensor product here also with respect to x positive. So I let the, the symmetry acting. So if, if I have a unique ground state, needless to say, that ground state has the symmetry uh, of the interaction. And that means, as you can easily show, that there will be unitary representation um, on the GNS space that implements the symmetry. But here we take the Symmetry acting only on half the chain. And so generally, if, if, it's, uh, uh, if it's not a rounded state, if there is entanglement between the left and right halves of the chain, this will not be the state invariant. Uh, so we need to prove something. And uh, the statement is that there is a projected representation of G that implements this. Um, so, so completely, you have, you have defined the symmetry tensor product in this? Yes. So for instance, um, you can do it on local observables that are not written only on a finite system, which is known as in this full chain. And things that are automorphisms are always continuous, and you can uniquely extend them. So, so what that means, there exists unitaries and I can use the notation root on G, H, and then the pi there of G bar G A is equal to root by G by A root by G. Okay. Um, so what is a uh, I'll, I'll, I will maybe give just a one brief reference of what projected representations are, if it's necessary. Um, but let me first mention result number two. Um, so, if you have two interactions, P0 and P1, they're desymmetric and Equivalent according to this uh, definition, 
and the projective representations uh, so there will be two so I maybe I have to give them a name um, no, not two. associated with two systems Well, the same equivalence class of projective representations, which I'll tell you in a second what, what that means. Um, so for, fin for finite G, these equivalence classes of projective representations. Are labeled by an abelian group, which is called the second cohomology group of G with values in the one. If it's a finite group, it's also a finite group. There will be a finite number of classes. So this is an exact labeling of the equivalent classes in the case of finite groups. Something looks like that, yeah? The representation fields are not split into right and left representation. Um, well, I mean, yes, yeah, so I, I can write the uh, symmetry on the whole chain as a tensor product of the symmetry acting on the left and the symmetry acting on the right because um, I've assumed that these are, these are local symmetries that act on the sides individually. Okay. And, and we, I will use that here. So this, uh, so that means that these labels give you an index, an invariant of this equivalence class. Because if they are related like this, you will have the same the projective representations, they will be the same, there will be different equivalent spaces and everything, uh, but they will belong to the same equivalence class. And so it says that this equivalence class, or that label, uh, is constant for the equivalence class. Which means that there is an exponential curve, so you can say that this is constant, this value of this index is constant along curves of symmetric curves of interactions between the field classes. Okay. Um, yes, you see go. I, I. The result why you are putting there is more or less mean to expert around 2000 for two properties, for state satisfying oh, yeah. properties. And um, the breakthrough for me is that uh, it shows the subsequent state satisfied with properties. That is how we can connect. Right. And there is no uh, project. Uh, Properties will automatically give you receive the presentation because of common sense. So that is already known and notarized, and it's usually around um, 2000. So I have to say this uh, is more, which is emphasized so, by important. So you don't want to take credit for result one, is what you're saying? Yeah, I will. Right. Then take credit for result two. Yeah, I will. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> And I would like to advertise my research report on this research. I think this is very important. Right. I think that could be like this. Okay. Good. Well, but there's lots of results in the literature. You still have to put them together. Um, okay. So, so maybe I should. Uh, just apply to the gas function there. And is it working better? Sorry? And is it working better? It is working a bit better. Or you can use some water, which. Yes, I could do that too. Um, this one certainly works better than the other one. Okay. Uh, this one is wet, but it works. It is, but it's all right. Yeah, it will dry. So, um, the 
back here. But there isn't the time to include those results, and it doesn't make sense to try to include the second. The first. Well, maybe just first a word about projective representations. We have our group G. So projective representation of G of H is a, is a, is a map of Hagenian unitaries. Right? So Let me talk about unitaries um, such that. U of G, U of H is equal to, so for the representation, this should be U of G H. And there's a phase factor here, so this constant is in U1. Um, that's what it means to be projective representation. It follows that PC is that to satisfy some condition. But I'm not going to use it uh, for what I'm going to. Today, a true cosine condition, and you can classify these up to an equivalence list, and this equivalence list is the following. So, so, um, so for any P, a function that assigns a complex number of absolute value one to the element in the group, uh, if I define U tilde G using P of G, U of G, you see that it's also a projective representation. I mean, it'll just be, it satisfies this relation, there's a different C tilde. And the C tilde GH will be something like this. It's a relation, relation to the, between these coefficients. And so the projective uh, representation is thus related. It's two uh, C's that are related by a formula like that to the function of the group. And I, I call it the group. Well, this is in equivalence relation. So, Overuse of uh, term as usual in mathematics, of course. Um, but uh, so what I said there that if you do this for a, a finite degree G, then there's it, there will be equivalence classes of projective representations <coughs> for each of these uh, scalars, these co two cosine functions, uh, C of G and H, and um, these will be labeled by this object. And I'm going to say this object is the labels for these. Representations. Um, but uh, this this result can you can also apply for continuous groups if you want. Um, it's just that it's less clear what the, what the total classification. Okay. So there's more to say, of course, about this, but that's that's all we uh, we, we really need. So what we need to do is given the setup that we have, construct a projective representation. And then uh, that's what result one says. And then result two says, um, it will belong to a certain equivalence class, and that equivalence class will not change if we go over depth curves of symmetric models with the new Yes? Do 
want to assume that thing down. I mean, that there is, I mean, just one trivial representation. Can mm. one prove that this, this is complete? Essentially, that if two, uh, I mean, models have the same projective type of representation, they can be connected by a gap? So that's, um, that's another question, whether, whether the classification is, is, is complete. And, um, well, there are some results about that, but I also don't think it is, it is not established. Right. Uh, along the lines of the statement. Yes, it, it is along the lines of that statement. Um, but this I could, I could replace by a version of the split property. Which the convention plays a very important role, but I want to try to avoid talking about too much so in, in the hopes that you will still follow me. So, um, the prerequisite is, uh, the first thing we're going to use is, is the crazy adiabatic evolution. These things, these things are there. In, in the form I developed in the paper with Bachmann and Interactive with Sims. And it's about these, these differentiable curves of interactions. <clears throat> Say, with, this is not the only case that applies to but this is our situation. So we have such a curve with a unique gap ground state with a gap uniform bounded below by some positive constant and the kind of the rest. Um, so then uh, what you can show, and you can find the explicit expressions. Uh, a, good, a good reference is part one of my, my review series with uh, Bob Sims and an LAR, uh, the one in the theater journal of Black Matter Physics 2019, you need all the details of this. So there exists the interaction T of S. So this is not an interaction of a, of a, of a physical model, it's some auxiliary thing. Um, so and let me immediately write it in, in the standard form uh, as I had on the board there that I raised, uh, which is also in the, I mean, the assumption that I have will be a stretched exponential decay. Uh, and there's an explicit formula that I'm not going to write. Um, it wouldn't teach you any, anything very much, uh, except maybe one thing that it will have. So if, if Ts has uh, the symmetry G, this Ts will also have the symmetry G. Um, loosely speaking, and it's it, uh, defined in terms of the derivative of, of phi with respect to s. That's why I need differential curves. And then, um, so if you, if then this generates uh, the dynamics with respect to the time parameter s. And I'll consider S as a time, it's a, it's a, it is a time dependent interaction that I uh, sold the dynamics with this time dependent, uh, going, time dependent interaction and I call it alpha S. So my dynamics was called tau T, but then I call this alpha S. So this is a Heisenberg dynamics on the observables that does the following. You find the unique ground state um, let's call these omega s, s in 0, 1, say. Uh, you will have that omega s of an observable t is omega 0 of the involved observable. For all s. So this alpha s follows the ground state uh, along the parameter s from 0 to 1. 
And, and it's important that it's uh, generated by a short range interactor. Yeah, I'm going to show you how I'm going to use that. So, so then uh, our first step is really to apply this uh, this result, uh, is, uh, this quasi linear evolution, to the, to a curve that connects my t um, to t trivial, and this is. This is without symmetry in this case. Okay, so um, I have such a curve, and the, the assumption is that it's a curve with the unique gap ground state um, that connects uh, T and T trivial, and has such a PCS. And um, I'm going to decompose this PCS. So it's, uh, it has interactions of arbitrary range, but it's <coughs> K as a set exponential. I'm going to decompose it, so I'm going to write this Cs as um, T L of S, R of S, D of S, where T L of S is equal to the C X uh, L X N, X N of S, if this interval x minus n x plus n is in the left half of the chain, which I define to be minus infinity zero, yeah. and I, I do the same for the right, if, if it's in the right half. And there are, of course, intervals that are neither in the left half or, in the, right, or the right half, and all these, so n, n zero otherwise, okay? So this is this, only these terms. And then all remaining terms going to ds. It's, it's the sum x and t x and restricted to x minus n x plus n. A non zero intersection. So it's minus infinity zero. And since uh, it's easy to see, it is bound to the stretch exponential k, so it gives you that this is summable in norms. And so this is a, a well-defined. It's an infinite sum, but it's well-defined. It's an element of the alpha. So, um, so if I, if I, this CL of S generates Alpha can be represented by index alpha S L uh, on the let's call this A L. So let's call this L and let's call this R. And then of course the other ones R generate the dynamics of A L R. And I consider the tensor product of these two as the free dynamics. And then I have one more term, one more bounded term in the Hamiltonian I'm going to treat by interaction fiction. So, so you know, you have to solve a differential equation that it involves the free evolution and this bounded term. And uh, I'm not going to write it now because we're running out of time. And so, uh, so what it means is that alpha s can be written as a free evolution, which is the decoupled dynamics on the left and the right uh, infinite chain, composed with something that is some unitary evolution uh, with an element in the alpha. So, uh, and so we, we now apply this to our 
situation with S equal to 1. We get information about the unique ground state of the interaction P, which um, uh, will, in this curve, be, say, I'm going, this is my P1 in the curve, and this is my P0 in the curve. So that, uh, doing, that means that this omega 1 uh, is equal to omega 0, which is the chronic state, the unique ground state of the trivial model, uh, composed of alpha s, which is this tensor product, uh, composed of this over here. And so, since this is a, a product state, if I, uh, if I forget about this for a second, and I compose with this split dynamics that is independently evolving the left and the right half, um, then I can define this. Uh, it means I have two product states. I call this only a one now. This is if this composition gives me a state that is product between the left and the right half of the chain. So this was a full product. These are automorphisms that have only interactions on the left. These only on the right. And so before I do that, I have this. So my unique gap ground state it has this structure. And this is in fact one version of the split property. So you can write it like that. It's 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 not a product state. Split between, it's not product between left and right, but it can be fixed to be an identity if I allow some unitary evolution with the U in, in the alpha. Yes. So, so, which is a subtle point? I'm not saying explain the subtle point, but where, somewhere here there must be something very subtle happening, right? Split properties, it's not an obvious thing. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in general, no. But, but this is this is what we use. Yeah, what are you using to get the composition? You must be using something yeah, interaction about friction. the gap and so on. Interaction friction. The decay of the interactions. So that if I sum over all interactions, I connect left and right, I get something bounded. That's, that's, that's basically right. the important point. Yeah. The, the and to get to have that, you need decay of the interactions. To get decay of these interactions in the equation of adic evolution, you need a gap. Bounded and kind of decaying, so it yes. makes sense to say that this V of S is basically acting in, in a local evolution model, right. so you can define it right. as a unitary action. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so this uh, relation between the states gives us a relation between the GNS representations, which is very easy to see, because it basically says that um, this factorized state and the smooth state are related by this conjugation to the unitary. So that means that the GNS representations are also related by conjugation to the unitary. Can I ask a quick question, Bruno? Sure. Since you mentioned before that your first assumption was not actually proved, is the right if you have this? Uh, Equivalence to the trivial state necessarily, right? Is that yes, I think so. But the but final result. This has proved. This has been proved. Yeah. Yes, correct. Exactly. exactly. So I, took, I made a shortcut. <laughs> so, so this implies that uh, uh, this omega one has a, a GNS representation phi, and then the omega one phi and L, I have that represent the genetic representations. Let's call them by L and by R, I think. So this relation then becomes that phi of A is equal to by L times by R of U1 by 1. By R of A by R. If you write as omega 1 
is unitary equivalent to omega 1 tau tensor of omega 1 r which are these things. So I'm sort of saying this is kind of not that important to keep track of what exactly this unitary is. I keep track of the fact that, that it is unitary. So you're using a SIP property here that the NSF presentation factorizes into an FMI. Yes, but this is pretty obvious. No, no, but there, right? I mean, that's a pi n and pi r. Right. It should be the tensor product for FMI, yes. right? Which yes. This is not a solid thing. I think, do you mean in the formula? You mean this formula? The last pi. If you want to start. Yeah, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Go ahead. So, um, now I know that uh, the beta t is also product. It's in, it happens in all the sides independently. So, um, so if this is unitary equivalent to this, I can also compose with this automorphism, and it will still be unitary equivalent. But the automorphism uh, represents the symmetry splits over the left and the right half. It's a tensor product. So if this is the beta G L, I define it into R. You can imagine that this is some L. And I get this division. Um, but we had a symmetry overall. So this here is omega 1, is invariant under the symmetry. And so I have to I have omega 1 is uh, uh, equivalent to omega 1 L, omega G L. Um, and uh, on the other hand, omega 1 is also equivalent to just omega 1 L tensor of omega 1 R. So it comes here. Okay. So this goes here. And I get that um, this tensor product, omega L tensor omega 1 R, is equivalent to the tensor product omega 1 L with the symmetry, omega R with the symmetry. It is not a totally trivial fact because these, the, 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 these are all pure states. I define them by composing pure states with automorphisms. They are all pure states. So then it follows that um, each of these factors must be unitary equivalent. So for instance, uh, like this. And now you must. Sorry, what, what have you been using the DNS representation for? There. So, this is the GNS representation. Yeah, that's right. What, what did and this relation here that I obtained this state from this state by just conjugating with you, that means that uh, if, if you, before I write this, you put conjugation with you in there, but then because it's the representation, it comes out. Mm -hmm. And then what you get is that this is a unitary then now on the GNS representation. And it says that this representation is unitary equivalent to this representation. Right, you don't seem to be talking anymore about the GNS space afterwards. That's why I might want to. Well, this has to exist somewhere. It, 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 there is a representation on the GNS Hilbert space of omega 1. Yeah, I, I should maybe explain a little more. So if you have this relation, then you can represent uh, these two states with their own the different representations on the same space with the. In the second graph. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm using. It's really true that I'm back. Yeah, but it's, it's here. I'm just not sure what you infer from that because then you talk again about oh my God. So. Well, this is this is that this is just saying this in a short notation. Okay. Okay. Unitary. Okay. The wiggle is unitary equivalence. I mean, so I'm just saying there exists a unitary. I'm not putting the unitary in the notation. I don't care in the end what it, what it is. It's just the equivalence that matters. And that's not the same statement as above. Well, that is just a relation between the states, right? Um, but it follows from that. Okay, so now, um, so now I can uh, tensor again. 
with uh, omega by L. Uh, if you tensor uh, two equivalent pure states with another pure state, same one, you get again something that's equivalent. And so uh, and this is equivalent to omega one. So it's the relation that we had before. This one. And so what I'm saying is that, uh, and this is also omega 1, because it is omega 1. So I get that omega 1 composed with beta g r is equivalent to omega 1. So that means that uh, uh, this representation, that the DNS representation of this, which is given one representative of it, is that is the S representation of omega 1 composed with this automorphism. It's on the same Hilbert space since the A new representation. But this representation is unitary equivalent to the representation that I have. So from that, it follows that there exists this U G R on the Hilbert space H, such that I have to relate the relation that I want. Um, I composed with beta r g is equal to u r g phi u r conjugate. So that is the representation I'm after. Well, maybe it's not immediately clear that this is a graphical representation, but um, you can now do this for two elements, g and h. And you can do it all at once for GH, and you can do it separately for GNH, and you get composition. And in the end, um, uh, you can show, well, maybe, maybe I'll, just, I'll just write it. GNH now in G. So I'm writing. Maybe it will be good to write it. Maybe it will be here. And now you can uh, shuffle things around. You, you multiply from the right, and then say uh, ug uh, and from the left with ugh r star. And what you're going to get, I will put it here on is um, that u r g h um, star u g r u h r commutes with the representation. So omega was a unique gap ground, so it's a pure state. So phi is irreducible. And so it says that this operator commutes with the representation. It must be a constant times the identity is unitary. The constant has to be a complex number of absolute value one. So we have this. Some function g h. And the identity where this is a u1, and this is exactly the projective view relation. You know, by using you know, I think I will. Uh, so this uh, is the proof of result one. The Jusika says was is old news since about mid 2000, but it may well be, but very few of us were aware. Um, and now the, the reasoning to, pre, to prove result two is not very different, used with all the same, same kind of ideas. And um, then you prove that this uh, projective representation that you get um, from another interaction that is 
connected by the dimensional gap symmetric path, um, will satisfy the same, well, first of all, will be unitary equivalent to one that satisfies the relation in the same G up to multiplication by some function of zero, which is exactly the equivalence relation up to multiplication. Okay. You need time. You give me a warning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to talk. <laughs> 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 <laughs>